The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one of whom I said, A man is coming after me, who ranks ahead of me, because he existed before me. I did not know him, but the reason why I came baptizing with water was that he might be made known to Israel. John testified further, saying, I saw the Spirit come down like a dove from heaven and remain upon him. I did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, on whomever you see the Spirit come down and remain, he is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now I have seen and testified that he is the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Behold the Lamb of God, John the Baptist pointed out to the crowd. And then, as the Gospel of John tells us, the next day he repeated himself, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is not the last time this phrase, this descriptive phrase, will be heard in the New Testament. Indeed, it is the centerpiece of the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, which all centers on the wedding feast of the Lamb who was slain, the Lamb of God. For John the Baptist, as a deeply believing Jew, the figure of the Lamb of God would have already been well imprinted in his mind. Because as we look at the Old Testament and we search for the Lamb of God there, it's easy to find. There is the real Lamb and the symbolic Lamb. The real Lamb is the Paschal Lamb of the Exodus, the Lamb that the Israelites are commanded to sacrifice at the twilight hour before they leave Egypt, and then to smear its blood over the doorposts of their houses so that the angel passing by will leave them alive and save them. Then they are to eat this lamb together as a family, as a family of faith that is united in the God of Israel. And so for Israel, the Paschal Lamb of God is a, con a t continual reminder from that day to this, of liberation from slavery and oppression. But there is another lamb in the Old Testament, the symbolic lamb that we hear of alluded to today in the, in the words of the prophet Isaiah, namely <clears throat> the mysterious suffering servant that Isaiah presents to us. Today we hear the words, the Lord formed me as his servant from the womb and this servant, Isaiah will go on to say, like a lamb led to the slaughter, he gives his life as an offering for sin. And so here we have not a real physical lamb, but you, so to speak, a spiritual lamb of sacrifice, a human being that is like the lamb led to slaughter. And so this lamb of God in the suffering servant tells us that for Israel, the Lamb of God represents not only deliverance from oppression and slavery, but deliverance from the deeper slavery of sin. And we have the Lamb of God brought before us this Sunday throughout the world, and here in the United States, on the 35th sad commemoration of the Roe versus Wade decision by the Supreme Court. And it calls to question whether the word of God can enlighten us about our state as a nation in the wake of that decision so many years ago. When we search through the prophet Isaiah and what he says about the, the suffering servant, like a lamb led to the slaughter, we realize that he describes a social and political setting that is really, though it described his own, in many respects is very much like ours as well. We had all gone astray like sheep, the prophet says, each following his own way. 
That's the world into which the suffering servant was sent and is sent, each following his own way. For us in the United States, since Roe versus Wade, we have followed the way of choice. The choice to take innocent life in the womb without having to give any public justification. The choice that flows from this choice, historically we can see, the choice to manufacture embryonic human life, to freeze it indefinitely, to experiment upon it if we choose. The way of unimpeded choice. We could see that the Roe versus Wade decision has driven to the margins of our culture the choice for life. It's as if it's one of any many choices that one can make, but one that's not particularly favored. Indeed, it's one that now people are saying we shouldn't make at all, and we should even enforce by law that people should not have children. Each following his own way. And so it is that as the prophet goes on, of the speaking of the world into which the suffering servant came, truth stumbles in the public square. And so it has. Truth stumbles with regard to the nature of the creature inside the mother's womb. Who is this? Is this just, as was early said after Roe, just a matter, a mere collection of tissues? Or is this a living human being, as each one of us was when we began our life, and therefore entitled to the same respect that every other human being deserves? Truth stumbles on this question and continues to stumble. Truth stumbles regarding the effects on women of the effects of the, what, what abortion does to them. Physically, for example, there's a, a question debated for years as to whether or not abortion is related to the rise in breast cancer. And maybe it is and maybe it isn't, but what has been uh, notable is the attempt to just banish any evidence that suggests there is a correlation, that no one need to worry. What about the effects on women emotionally and spiritually? Uh, this is all driven from the, the consciousness. I've been struck by the fact that uh, in all these years, 35 years, when we have in the movies great realism about everything that happens, everything will just get it right out there and look at it as it is. How many movies have you seen that treat this problem? It seems to me, unless I've been completely out of touch, that, which is possible, that uh, it's as if this, this central social divisive issue it didn't even exist, uh, that, it, that we don't even need to think about it. Truth stumbles in the public square. Truth stumbles regarding the effects on men from all these abortions, 50 million abortions in these 35 years, 50 million. People are, are pleased to note that the abortion rate is dropping, as you may have seen in the paper. It's down now to 1.2 million a year, which is better than 1.6 million to be sure, but 1.2 million abortions a year is hardly anything to be excited about. 50 million abortions, and so often our attention centers on the mother and the child, and rightly, but what about the men? What about the fathers of these children? It's as if they don't even exist, as if we don't need to consider at all the effects on them for good or ill, the effects on them uh, uh, for, for having lost a child that they were responsible to protect. And what does this do to them as a man? Uh, all these questions are buried deep in a person's un unconscious probably, but they work their way. Uh, what effects has abortion such on demand had on men's taking responsibility for their actions. Doesn't this make it all the easier for them to put all the responsibility on the woman? But these questions are, of course, must be driven to the margin. Truth stumbles in the public square. <laughs>